Hello. Hi. Hi. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, so, <laughs> make you the co host. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Should I try sharing the screen or something? Yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. That should be fine. Uh, let me see if I can get it to show on full screen. Yeah, is it is it fine now? Do you see it as a, in full screen? Yes. Yeah, it looks All right, good. great. Perfect. Good, good, good. So uh, I, I hope I haven't gone uh, too low. I, I mean, I, I, plan if I, I, I plan this talk for grad students. So I'm going to start really, really, really on the basics. Uh, I, I think that was clear on your abstract. And that's kind yeah, of, yeah. Uh, that's what I was hoping, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I certainly appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I hope uh, it works because usually uh, I always try to start really like, okay, let's talk about the basic things and then I, I start uh, going crazy. But that, that should happen about 40 minutes in, so don't worry. It sounds it, good. And do you mind if this is recorded? No, no, no. You, you don't mind, okay. No, 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 go ahead. Uh, in usually, fact, if you could send me the recording afterwards, I'd appreciate it. Usually we post it on YouTube and that's what okay, I plan to do. Great. So if that's, I just send you the link. Yeah, that, that, that's fine. Thanks. Cool. <clears throat> How, how's your semester going? <laughs> Do, do you have, uh, uh, what are your semesters like? I mean, I don't know. So in Chile, it's the opposite. So we have the first term from March to August, and then the second term goes from August to December, except that there's been a lot of protests in the university. So we're actually ending on by the end of January. <laughs> oh, I see. So, yeah, but I mean, I'm teaching two courses, I'm teaching uh, measure theory and I'm teaching a course on algorithmic uh, group theory uh, along with somebody else. It's not that bad. Yeah, yeah it sounds good. Hello, good to see everybody. Hello, Sebastian, welcome. Hello, thanks. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, maybe just we'll wait, maybe just in one more minute, just in case there's latecomers. Mm -hmm. Uh, are you in, in Chile right now, Sebastian? Yep. Yep. Okay. That's far, far away. <laughs> well, yeah, far from you, far from everything, in fact. <laughs> but but it's, things it's, are going uh, pretty fine here right now. Uh, almost no cases. It's, oh, it's that's nice. great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. OK, so you guys are handling things reasonably well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, things are going fine. Uh, uh, it's it's never well. It got bad a few months back here, but now it's very nice. Almost no cases, um, no well, few restrictions. <laughs> hey, Doug. Hey, how you doing, Sebastian? Good, good. How about you? Yeah, doing okay. Hanging in there. <laughs> mm -hmm. We should talk about groups sometime. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so you came to this talk to to see your theorem uh, somewhere in, in the talk, right? Uh, 
no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to happen. So I'm, I'm telling you, at some point, I'm going to have a, a full screen saying Dag Lind, uh, 1986. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's why I'm here, right? <laughs> Wallowing in glory, <laughs> like a pig. <laughs> so, so um, you you ready to start, Sebastian? All right. Okay, so we're happy to have um, Sebastian Barbier from University of. Santiago of Chile. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, okay, so go ahead, <laughs> talk about effective timing. All right. Yeah, great, thank you very much for this invitation. Um, before starting, just let me know if my accent gets very, gets too rough at some time. Uh, it's been some time since I was a postdoc at Vancouver, so uh, probably I'm not speaking as good as I used to. So if, if I'm starting to be, uh, and understandable, just please let me know. It's, right? the, so, it's the Canadian accent, you see, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, well, before that, I used to have a French accent while speaking, that was even worse. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, so let me talk about effective dynamics. Uh, I intended this talk for grad students, so I don't even assume you know what a dynamical system is. And to be honest, uh, neither do I. Usually what I do is I just go to archive and I look at the recent articles on dynamical systems. And to be honest, I don't even understand what 80% of them talk about. So I, I can't really give a talk about dynamical systems in general, but I can tell you what I understand uh, for dynamical systems. And a decent enough setting is this one. I'm always gonna be considering some group, usually countable, which is acting on a set. All right, and that's what I'm gonna call a dynamical system. Of course, that's a huge setting and you can't say anything uh, consequential if you are that, uh, that big. So usually you start restricting to certain flavors of dynamical systems. So uh, one usual flavor people consider are topological dynamical systems. So here you still have your countable group, but instead of just having an action on a set, you act on a topological space, usually compact metrizable, and you act through homomorphisms, right? So you might be interested in understanding things like these. You can develop theory for things like these. Also, another flavor is algebraic dynamical system. Here, Dag knows a lot about those. Um, here you have a countable group, which is acting on another group, usually a billion. And instead of acting through homomorphisms, you act by automorphisms, right? So it's another way of doing dynamical systems. You could also go to the measurable setting. So here, this is also called ergodic theory. You also have a group, but you act on a standard Borel space uh, through a probability measure preserving action. And you also have this Borel probability measure that you're preserving. Okay, so what I wanna do today is uh, I wanna talk about the less known cousin of all these flavors, which are effective dynamical systems. So here, instead of considering uh, just any countable group, and I'm usually gonna be restricting to finitely generated groups, and I'm gonna act on an effective space through effective actions. So now the question everybody's gonna be wondering is, what does effective means? And uh, I'm gonna take my time to give you a precise definition of this, but essentially it means that I can describe through an algorithm, the space and the action entirely. Okay, so that's the whole idea. I'm gonna be considering dynamical systems that I can somehow present through a computer algorithm or something like that. So let me tell you what are these algorithms I'm considering. So uh, informally, an algorithm is just a list of instructions that are applied sequentially. So most of you know computer programs, you have probably programmed in Mathematica, uh, Maple, I don't know, uh, maybe Python. Uh, if not, uh, at least you've done some cooking. So if you've done some cooking, well, you just follow the instructions and uh, hope you're competent enough to do it right and you get something in the end, right? Mathematically, well, algorithms are a little bit more precise. For instance, uh, everybody knows the algor Euclid's algorithm to compute the greatest common divisor of two integers. So here's this algorithm. If you have two uh, positive integers, A and B, you do the following. If one of them is zero, you return the other. 
If not, you return the same algorithm, but now evaluated on B and A mod B. And uh, this algorithm is very well known. It gives you, if you start doing that repeatedly, eventually one of these numbers is going to reach zero, so you're going to return something. And it turns out that thing is the greatest common divisor of A and B. So as you see, it's just a sequence of instructions that you are applying and you get some result. All right. So of course, this is not formal. I, I, I should be able to formalize very well what an algorithm is. And one way of doing this, of doing this thing is through Turing machines. So let me spend a few minutes telling you what are these famous Turing machines. All right. So Turing machines are essentially, and here I'm stressing the word essentially, given by three things. You have a finite set sigma, which is called the alphabet. You have a finite set Q, which is called states. And you have a map that goes from pairs in sigma times Q, alphabet times states. And it gives you an alphabet, an element of the alphabet, an element of the state. And it tells you how to move, either to the left, you stay, or the right. And that's called a transition function. OK, that's formal, but it doesn't tell me anything. Uh, Additionally, I should say a few things. Uh, real Turing machines, the ones you actually use, have some extra special perks. So besides the alphabet, you add another symbol, which you call a blank. You add uh, auxiliary symbols. So actually, this transition function that I drew up is uh, working on this uh, extended alphabet. And you also have two special states. One is called the initial state, and one is called the holding state. OK, let's see. What's this thing really about? So all the information I gave you above induces a map on the space sigma to the z times q times z. How? Well, I can draw sigma to the z as just a bi-infinite tape, as it's written here. I fill it with symbols on sigma. And I'm going to call this pair q times z as a position, which I'm marking by this head. So you see this Q here pointing at some position in Z? Well, that's just coding this Q times Z. So I think of it as a head pointing at some position uh, with some state. And then what I do is I just look at my transition function. My transition function here says, if you read black and you're in state Q, then write white, go to state R, and move to the left. So the machine does exactly that. OK, so that induces a map on that space above, and I can iterate that map, right? So, all right, that's uh, some dynamics that uh, you define with these, uh, <clears throat> with these Turing machines. And uh, the main definition is the following. If now I give you a word on this alphabet sigma, so that's just n symbols put together, and I extend that word to the left and to the right by adding blank symbols, I do give the following definition. I'm going to say that the Turing machine with alphabet sigma accepts W, this finite word, if after applying a finite number of times this map induced by this machine, starting on position zero and on the initial state, I somehow reach the final state, the halting state. OK, that's the definition. And if the machine does not accept this word, I'm going to say it loops on that word. Right. OK, so example, suppose I take this alphabet I, I gave you before, uh, black and white, and I take this, this word W that's black, white, black. So this is the extended word that I drew before. I take this word and I put blank symbols everywhere else. I start at the origin and I start at state Q0. And I read my transition function. Transition function says, well, put white goes to state A and move to the left. All right, that's what my machine did. Then I repeat. My transition function now says, well, read a blank. If you read A, put a black, go to B, move to the right. All right. And then my machine again says, well, now put a black, move to the right, go to QH. And oops, I got to the halting state. So the machine accepts this word. OK. So whenever I'm giving a Turing machine, there's a set of words that this machine accepts, and I can define that as the language of that Turing machine. So Turing machines give me a way to define particular kinds of languages. OK, so 
that's what uh, I'm going to do now. I'm going to take a subset of sigma star. Sigma star just denotes the set of all words on sigma of any length. And I'm going to say that L is recursively enumerable if there's a Turing machine such that W belongs to the language if and only if W is accepted by T. So if somehow I can give you a machine that accepts exactly the words on L, I'm going to say that this is a recursively enumerable language. OK, I'm going to say that L is co-recursively enumerable if its complement is recursively enumerable. And I'm going to say that this language is decidable if this language is both recursively enumerable and co-recursively enumerable. So this is uh, computability 101. I've just defined the main objects of computation in roughly 10 minutes. So if you are a little bit lost, don't worry. That's natural. Uh, if you've seen these things before, they make a lot of sense. The notion of decidability essentially is telling you that there's a Turing machine that can tell you exactly when you're in the language and when you're not. While recursively enumerable languages, there's just a machine telling you when you're in, but if you're not, have no way of knowing. The machine just loops, but you don't know whether it will eventually accept or not, right? So that's the intuition be be behind these things. To give you a few examples, uh, if I take the language of words in 0, 1, which represent numbers which are divisible by 7 uh, in base 2, I should say, well, that's decidable, right? I can probably write down an algorithm that graphs a word on 0, 1, it figures out which number it is, and then checks whether it's divisible by 7. I could devise a set of a transition function, a big alphabet that does this thing. Uh, I could also probably check whether a word is a palindrome or not, right? I could devise a transition function doing that thing. So essentially, and this is something that's a little bit hard to get convinced, this notion of Turing machine can really capture this intuitive notion of algorithm that we have, that you have a finite list of states and that you can implement uh, if commands, while commands, uh, for commands, et cetera, et cetera, whatever you're used to doing while programming. OK, so that's about words. But in mathematics, we're usually interested in objects which are not words. But most objects in mathematics can be encoded as words, really. Uh, for instance, uh, non-negative integers, well, uh, I can just use the binary representation on 0 and 1. So integers I can represent as words, no problem. If I, now I want the integers with a sign, well, I just maybe I add an extra symbol to to encode whether the number is negative or positive, right? That's what computers do to work with integers. Well, if I want to encode rationals, I just encode two integers, that's easy. And then I can start getting, I can get a little bit more ambitious. Um, if I want to, for instance, encode polynomials with rational coefficients, well, I could have an integer for that encodes the degree and then a finite sequence of rationals for the coefficients. There are many ways to do this. Uh, if I want to encode a finite graph, I could probably just encode uh, an integer saying how many vertices it's got, and then a sequence of pairs uh, separated by some symbol that's telling me which are the edges, and so forth. I could do matrices with rational entries, simply shell complexes, finitely presented groups, even Turing machines, right? I could grab a Turing machine and I could encode it as a word. So, Many objects in mathematics, even Turing machines themselves, can be encoded as words. And then I can actually talk about the citability of sets of these certain objects through the citability of the languages of their encodings. Right? So for instance, I could talk about uh, the citability of a subset of natural numbers instead of just a, a language. Right? OK. Now that you're convinced about that, I can tell you what do I mean by an effective dynamical system. So remember, uh, what I want here is I want to be able to completely describe the action, and I want to be able to completely describe the space through a Turing machine. OK? So of course, there are there's more than one way of doing this. If I want to do this in a measure theoretical context, there's one way to do it. What I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to try to adapt a particular setting in topological dynamics. So bear with me. Now I can be a little bit more precise. I want the things to be described through a Turing machine. So let's go slowly. I'm going to consider in this talk a very, very simple setting. 
I'm going to consider actions of a group gamma on a set X, where X is just going to be a subset of the Cantor space. So I take 0, 1 to the n with the prodiscrete topology, that's the Cantor set, and I'm going to act on a subset of 0, 1 to the n. OK, but not just any set. There are way too many sets. Uh, I'm going to act on a particular kind of set. So given a finite word, w, with n symbols, w0 up to wn minus 1, I'm going to define the cylinder set uh, of w as the set of points in the Cantor set, which begin with w. Right, so these are one-sided infinite words on 0, 1. And I'm just taking all the words that begin with the word W. Okay, so that's uh, <clears throat> that's a base. Sorry, uh, that's a base for the predescript topology. And now I'm gonna define an effectively closed set as a set which is closed, and there is a recursively enumerable language such that I can write X as the Cantor space minus the union of the cylinders in, described by, by this language. So in other words, there's a Turing machine that's going to start giving me words. So it's telling me, OK, 0, 0, 1 is not in your set. 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0 is not in your set. And it's going to go forth and forth and forth, giving me more and more words. And each time the machine tells me a new word, OK, my set gets smaller. And eventually, this machine describes the whole space. OK, it describes the space by telling me uh, how to enumerate uh, cylinders for its complement. OK, it's one way to go. Uh, I can completely describe this set X by a Turing machine. So the, the language is recursively enumerable. So there's a Turing machine which accepts points there. So if I just give you the Turing machine, I've completely described X. Right, there's this algorithm that describes points in X. OK, I just copied the definition here. So what's the intuition behind this? Well, if I'm given uh, as an oracle, somebody magically gives me access to all coordinates of a point in 0, 1 uh, in the Cantor set, uh, there's an algorithm which, if I leave to work for an arbitrary long time, I don't know how much, it will eventually tell me if the point was not in my set. Right, because it starts enumerating everything that's not there. So eventually I will find out if it wasn't in my set. If it is in my set, I'll never know. Right, I'd have to wait an infinite amount of time to, to guess, but I don't know. Right, so it's telling me what's not in my set. Okay, and this is just a, a note. Here I did everything with the language 01 because it's a Cantor space, but for convenience, I can replace 01 with any finite alphabet and the definition is just the same. OK, I'm saying this because I will do it later on. All right, can I ask a question? everything yeah. good so far? Can I ask Questions? a question? Sure. Uh, is there a notion of effectively open set? And is it yes. a complement of an effectively closed set? Or is it the, yeah. Yeah. the opposite? So here I'm giving you a very, a very uh, restricted setting. There is a notion of effective open set that you can actually use to describe effective open sets in R, in, in higher dimensional spaces. Uh, here I'm, I'm doing something that's going to work precisely for subshifts in a very nice manner. So that's why I'm going this way. But yeah, there's notions of effectively open set. There's notions of effectively closed set. Uh, and there are actually uh, notions of effective anything that you want in topology. There are even effective uh, versions of very category theorem. There are, there are many interesting things, but yeah, there's indeed a notion of an effectively open set. And this set is precisely the complement of an effectively open set. Okay. Okay. In topological dynamics, we usually work with uh, closed sets. <laughs> so that's why here it's, it's interesting to have an, an effectively closed space. I see. But, but an effectively open set is one for which you can verify whether an element is in it. And an effectively yeah. closed set is one for which you can verify that an element is not in it, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. Is there a notion okay. of decide, decidable closed set? <laughs> yeah, you could. But that's too restrictive or something? Yeah, it is too restrictive. But uh, let, let me not get into that. OK, OK. okay. Yeah, so um, all right. So that's an effectively closed set. So now I'm, I'm in, in a position to give you a definition of 
what's an effectively closed action. So remember, my goal was I want to give you a notion of effectively closed action as an action that can be described by a Turing machine. So here's why I'm taking a particular restriction. I'm just going to consider groups which are finitely generated. This is just for convenience, but it will make my life incredibly easier. So I'm going to suppose that gamma is generated by a finite symmetric set S, which contains the identity of the group. And I'm going to take a set which is effectively closed. And I'm going to consider the following set. So I have an action. I know it is an action that's given to me. And I'm going to consider the set Y of all configurations on A to the N, where A is the alphabet 0, 1 to the S. So for every generator, I'm going to take uh, 0 or 1. And I'm going to take all those configurations such that if I project this, this bundle Y to, the, to S, then it is uh, the action of the group on the bundle at the identity. So I, I take just the projection on, on all these coordinates given by the generators and the identity, and I want them to behave as if they were, uh, as if it was the group acting, right? So pi S of Y is S times pi to the identity of Y for every S in the generating set. Okay, so essentially what I want to call is a point in the space, and then, all of its images through the group action, right? And my definition of effectively closed action is that an action is effectively closed if and only if this set is an effectively closed set, right? So what I added from before is, well, now not only I have an algorithm telling me when a point X is not in the set, but I can also tell you when, when I have two points, when one is not the image of the other. Right, because this algorithm for uh, checking that, that that gives me the complement of y is eventually going to tell me if this pair s, s y and x uh, has some issue, right? If it's not there. Okay, so it's just a way of uh, describing the action of a finitely generated group with um, <clears throat> sorry with a Turing machine. All right. Okay, um, so that's an effective um, close action. Uh -huh. Let me copy the, oh, yeah. Could, could you back up? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, sure. So, but by the way, so, so to, uh, if X is a subshift of finite type, then, then it is effectively closed. Yes. That's one. Um, but I, I'm trying to get my brain wrapped around what Y is. It's, um, so, so gamma is acting on the Cantor set, uh, um, but it's acting on some other, some subset of the, Cantor set. Yes. And then uh, Y is, um, I want to think of it as like Cantor set to the S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly that. It's Cantor set to the S. So essentially you have the point X and you have all of the images through the, so every generator okay. induces a homomorphism of the space. So you want S, X and SX for every element of generating set. So essentially, you call the, the, the ball of radius one of your finitely generated group acting on the space. But um, I guess, so if I take y of n of s, OK, I, I guess, um, uh, sorry, so, uh, I, I'm, I'm still trying to, OK, so pi is. Mm -hmm something in zero, one to the N. Okay. Right. I see. I see. So that we're just like um, encoding what the generators, where the generators map. Um, exactly. Okay. So uh, here I'm assuming I have an action. So if I know how the a generating unit ball, so if I know how a generating set acts, I know how the whole group acts. That's that's a whole point, and I can detect when uh, something is not correct. That's what the algorithm is telling me. So I can detect when y is not the image, uh, when x is not the image of uh, of uh, y and the rest, right? I, I see. So, yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give a second definition, which is equivalent and maybe uh, a little bit more um, intuitive a little bit later on. So. For now, let's, let's take this definition of effectively closed action. And 
here's an equivalent definition. It's not immediate that they're equivalent, but I'll, I'll tell you how. Uh, an action is effectively closed if and only if the space X is effectively closed. And furthermore, there's a Turing machine, which if I give an input, a generator, an integer, and Oracle access to all coordinates of X. So uh, if, the, uh, if, the, if the Turing machine wants to know what X, uh, what's the value of X at some point, it can know it. Then with this information, it can compute the value of the image at any point. So S, X, and N, right? So these two things are equivalent. It's not immediate. You need to prove a few things, but uh, it's telling you it is a different way of saying it, right? If I were to know that I have a point in X and that's important, I know that X in X, then I can compute the image, right? So I understand what the, what the, what the action is doing. I can compute it if I know that all the coordinates are, are there, if I, if, I, if I can generate. All right. Okay, so this is the notion of effective dynamical system I'm gonna work with. It's very restrained. It's a very particular class, but it's gonna be more than enough for what I wanna do. Sorry, so, can, I ask, can I ask one more question? Um, sure. So it, is the point, I'm sorry, this is um, elementary, but is the mm -hmm. point that, okay, you can compute all the coordinates of SX and that's equivalent to being able to say whether or not another element of X is not the image of, of SX. Yeah. You, can, you have to compute all the coordinates and eventually you can tell if they're different, but you can never tell, mm -hmm. you can never tell that they're all the same without computing all of them. Is that, is that the right? The yeah, point yeah, you, you can't, it? yes. Okay, exactly. Right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, please, please go on. No, it's fine, it's fine. So um, just to give you a few examples, if you know the odometer, uh, so you have just uh, set over to Z and you do addition uh, as an odometer, you find the first symbol, which is, uh, which is a zero and you turn it into one with a carry. Uh, well, that's clearly effective. You can check that with an easy algorithm because you can implement some by one, right? Uh, Subsets of finite type are not directly effectively close as per the definition I gave, but they are topologically conjugate to effectively closed actions. Because, well, uh, I can just, uh, if I have an SFT say on, on Z, on the integers, I can just uh, encode Z in N and then just uh, send the symbols to these coordinates and then act if I were, as if I were the shift, right? And well, another thing is that's important is that if I take a topological factor uh, that is a surjective uh, continuous gamma equivariant map from uh, uh, an action which is effectively closed, then the topological factor is also effectively closed, provided it acts on a subset of the of the counter space. That's not relevant because I can actually find uh, another extension which, which is like that. Okay, but this, this is a property that is preserved under factors, which is kind of nice. Okay, so let me give you a less trivial example, which I like a lot. Let me take again the counter space, now the whole counter space, and I'm gonna take two sequences of the same length of non-empty words, such that they partition the counter space in two different ways. So I'm gonna take X, X, uh, the counter space, it's gonna be the union of the cylinders. Uh, I actually want it to be a disjoint union. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna consider the homomorphism of the counter space, which maps every cylinder UI to BI by replacing prefixes. That means if I have a point in the counter space, which begins by UI, I delete UI and I add BI. Okay, as I said, these things were partitions and the, the unions were disjoint. This is in fact an homomorphism of the counter space. Uh, here's an example that uh, people like a lot. So for instance, if I take U1, 0, 0, U2, 0, 1, U3, U3, 1, U1, 0, V2, 1, 0, V3, 1, 1, you can check that these words partition the counter space. It's uh, those trees that are written below. And well, here are some examples of applying this homomorphism for instance, if I have 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, well, the first one begins by 0, 1, so I delete that and I replace it by 1, 0. So you can see that the image of the first one is uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, whatever, and so forth. You can check that these things are applications of this thing. Now, I really like this 
these examples because they generate very interesting groups. So uh, I'm gonna define three groups through these homomorphisms. First, I'm gonna consider the group of all such homomorphisms where the words are given in lexicographical order. I'm gonna call it F. Then I'm gonna consider the group with where all such homomorphisms are given in lexicographical order up to a cyclic permutation of one of them. That's gonna be called T. And B is the group of all such homomorphisms. And these groups turn out to be very famous. They are the Thompson's groups. Uh, they are finitely generated. They are even finitely presented, uh, even type F infinity, if you know what that means. Uh, and the funny thing is that their natural action on 0, 1 to the n is effectively closed. So the action that I just described by homomorphisms is effectively closed because, well, the space is clearly effectively closed. It's the whole counter space. And um, yeah, the action I can describe it very easily because uh, they are, if I know they are finitely generated and these homomorphisms are just described by these prefixes, that's certainly something I can compute, right? So great, I have that the natural actions of all three Thompson's groups are, are effectively close. Nice, I'm, I'm, I'm studying something interesting. Okay. Okay, so now after I've told you a lot about Turing machines and effective actions, you might be starting to wonder why should I care? Why am I listening to this guy ranting around about uh, effective actions? Well, first thing is that many interesting classes of dynamical systems are in fact effective. In fact, uh, unless you try very hard to define something uh, which has the halting problem or something embedded in it, you're gonna turn out defining something effective. And second is that many problems about dynamical systems uh, turn out to have computable theoretical answers. So you might ask things about, uh, if you know what that is, topological entropy or existence of factors or emptiness or whatever, whatever. And it turns out that sometimes the answer to that question is very related to computability. So it's interesting to understand this point of view because it gives interesting answers to some problems. Okay, so I'm gonna try to exemplify these, these things in what follows. Uh, oh. And before uh, ending up with that, why should I care about effective actions? Is because they, they give you a very, very strong tool. So this is called universality. Uh, it's a very nice result in Turing machines. It is, the, it is that there is a Turing machine, which uh, if I give it an input, a description of another Turing machine, it simulates its behavior. So I can describe a single Turing machine to which I can feed an input the description of another Turing machine, and it does what this Turing machine does. Okay, that's not so hard to prove with Turing machines, but if you start translating that into other contexts, it gives you very fantastic results. For instance, uh, there is this very beautiful result, which is a corollary of a theorem of Higman, that says that there's a universal finitely presented group, which contains copies of all recursively presented groups. So if you don't know what a recursively presented group is, don't worry. There's a finitely presented group which contains as a subgroup all finitely presented groups. That's a fantastic result in itself. And uh, there's uh, something about Turing machines going on behind. And it's a universality result that comes from understanding uh, computer theoretical things about uh, groups. Uh, if you've heard about Hilbert's 10th problem, you can actually use that result about universality to show that there's a universal polynomial, which if you fix some variables, you can realize all Diophantine sets as uh, sets of roots of it. So there are very fantastic results that uh, you can find when you take this notion of universality of Turing machines and you put it in a very weird setting. So what I'm interested in is doing the same for dynamical systems. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to tell you about the dynamical version of this uh, notion of simulation or universality of Turing machines. And for that, I'm going to need to introduce subshifts of finite type, which we have talked a little bit before. But let me do it formally right now, just for CD. Uh, let A be a finite set. And I'm going to consider the set of all maps from CD to A uh, with the pro-discrete topology and the shift action, where I'm just moving things around. Okay, so that's simple. I have all configurations and I move things around. 
a subset of the space is called the CD subshift if it is closed and invariant under the shift action. And a subshift is of finite type if there is a finite set and a set of forbidden patterns with support F such that uh, a point is in the subshift, if and only if I don't see that the, any of those forbidden patterns anywhere. So th that's that's a very known object. And uh, if people are not acquainted with them, uh, I can speak a little bit more. But subtypes of finite type are essentially sets of configurations that you can describe giving a list of finite patterns. So I give you, OK, I don't want to see this pattern or this or this finite list. And it's the set of all configurations where none of those patterns ever appear. So an example is better than many of my words. Uh, uh, the hard square shift, for instance, is the set of all maps from set square to zero one, such that I don't see any vertical or horizontally adjacent ones. So my forbidden patterns are those on the left. I don't want to see one next to one, either horizontally or vertically. And the hard square shift is the set of all maps from set square to zero one where those two things on the left never appear. OK, so that's a subshift of finite type. You can see it's a very nice class. It's, it admits a very concrete description. It's a finite description. I just give you a list of forbidden patterns. I don't even need to give you an algorithm giving you those patterns. I suffice to give the, the list. Um, these things are, of course, effective dynamical systems up to conjugacy. And uh, there is the, a beautiful theorem by Hochman that tells you that every effectively closed action, so as we defined it before, every effectively closed action of Z can actually be obtained as the topological factor of a subaction of a C3 subship of finite type. So this is weird. Go up to set C3, so you have uh, the space. There is a subship of finite type, so a finite set of forbidden patterns such that if you restrict the translation action just to one dimension, so you're just moving one dimension, you get a dynamical system with fact which factors on an arbitrary effective dynamical, effectively uh, closed action. So this is nice. Why? Uh, Subjects of finite type, as you can see, are very, I don't know, uh, you just define them by a finite set of forbidden patterns. It seems that you cannot do that much with them. But it turns out you can do a lot. Why? Because there are a lot of effective dynamicals, uh, effectively closed actions. And for each one of them, there is a subtle of finite type that essentially contains its information in this manner. Right? So this is a fantastic result of Mike Hoffman from 2009. Uh, moreover, this factor that I put below is not an ugly factor. It's a great thing. Uh, modulus uh, uh, and I. Um, and a group rotation, it's almost one to one. Uh, so, one to one, a set of full measure with respect to any invariant measure. It's what they call an almost trivial isometric extension. Okay, so it's a nice factor. It preserves a lot of properties. Yes, okay. Um, so, can, yeah. can I ask, you know, is, so I, I assume, okay, so the theorem must not be true for Z squared in, in place of Z cubed. I was going to say that. <laughs> but, um, you know, is there any intuition about why, you know, because it seems uh, I don't know, naively like Z squared would be just as good as Z cubed, you know? So the point is that I'm considering ex um, effective actions in general. Uh, I can show that in Z squared, there are effectively closed subshifts, which are not um, uh, sophic. That's through an argument that uses the amenability of the group. There's an example called the mirror shift. Essentially, you have three symbols. You have a symbol that, if it appears, it extends vertically all over. And then if this symbol appears, whatever you see on the right and on the left gets mirrored. So you see exactly the same thing, but mirrored. You can show through uh, an argument using Felder sequences that uh, this thing is not the, the factor of a subshift of finite type. So that, that's something that you can do on any amenable group if you are working hard enough. But the interesting thing is that if you now interpret this space uh, as a uh, sorry as a horizontal subaction of a seed square thing, you can show that the, the the effective dynamical system that you obtain is not the factor of any subaction of a set square subshell finite type because otherwise this guy would be soft. 
That, that's how the proof I know works. Oh, okay. So it's a little bit specific. <laughs> okay. It's it's the the worst thing is that that proof is not written anywhere. <laughs> so it appears as a as a remark in a chapter of Mike Hoffman in a book, but uh, it's anyway the proof is not really that hard. But anyway, believe me, the dimension is optimal. You can actually construct an effectively closed set action that cannot be obtained if you replace three by two. But life is not that bad if I take just effectively closed actions which are expansive. Expansive means uh, that there's a constant such that whenever I have two orbits that are a distance below this orbit, they are actually the same, right? And it turns out that expansive plus zero dimensional is the same as subshift. So you could think of these expansive effectively closed actions as subshifts, which are defined by a uh, Turing machine. So the set of forbidden patterns is, uh, recurs is recursively enumerable. Let me talk about that a little bit more. Expansive effectively closed actions are the same as effectively closed subshifts. And an effectively closed subshift is the same as a subshift of finite type. But instead of having a finite set of forbidden patterns, I have a recursively enumerable set of forbidden patterns. So some Turing machine describing it. OK, so that's nice. The expansive effectively closed actions, I can understand very well. They're just subshifts for which the set of forbidden patterns is given by some Turing machine. Great. OK, and the nice thing is that if I restrict to those, the theorem actually gets better. You can do it with set square. This is a theorem by Oberon Sadlik and also Duran Romashenko Shen. They show that if you have an effectively close expansive action, then it is topologically conjugate to the sets of action of a symbolic factor of an SFT. So here it's nice on two ways. First, you reduce the dimension. Second, you get to take the factor beforehand. So you take your SFT, you take your factor. That's what's called a suffix shift. And this suffix shift is actually just the trivial extension of the of your effective one dimensional subshift. Just repeat it all over in the vertical image direction. Okay, so this is a very nice result and it's particularly nice because of its applications. You can get a lot of classic results on the theory using this thing. For instance, uh, this is a very nice uh, old problem. Are there any set square subshifts of finite types such that the set square acts freely? So with no periodic points anywhere. That's a theorem by Berger and Robinson on the 60s, but it's a trivial result. It's a trivial corollary of this result above, right? It's very easy to, to give an, action, an effectively closed, uh, sorry, an effectively closed subshift, which has no periodic points, right? For instance, uh, the orbit closure of the tumor sequence or some Sturmian shift, if you know what I'm talking about, then use this theorem. It uh, extends to an SFT, which has uh, no periods on one direction. It's trivial on the other direction. Then do the same with the, the same shift or whatever, and just apply a uh, rotation. Take the product of those two systems, boom, you have an SFT with no periodic points. So it's kind of easy. Another result that's an easy corollary, it's the famous domino problem. Can you decide if I give you a finite list of forbidden patterns for a set square SFT, if the SFT is empty? That's known to be undecidable. That's a theorem by Berger. Uh, it's very easy to do with this theorem because the SFT that you construct, the set square SFT, actually depends only on the Turing machine. It's uh, You can effectively construct it. You can take an algorithm that, give, that you feed a Turing machine and it constructs the alphabet and the set of forbidden patterns. So from that, it's kind of easy to show that uh, emptiness is undecidable as a reduction from the holding problem. But more interestingly, I want to talk about the third corollary, which I really like, which is the characterization of the topological entropies of set square SFTs. So I need to tell you what topological entropy is. Uh, so let me give you a very, very uh, short definition. Uh, I'm just going to take a CD subshift. I'm going to take Vn as the Fellner sequence given by the balls. So I take the discrete interval 0 up to n minus 1 to the d, so a square ball. And I define Ln of x as the set of patterns in A to the Vn such that there is some point in the shift 
that restricted to Vn is equal to P. So essentially, it's the language of size n, all the patterns of size n times n times n times n that appear in the, in the subject. And the topological entropy is given by this beautiful formula. I just take the limit over this Felder sequence of the logarithm of the size of the language. Sorry, I need some cardinality signs inside the LM. Okay, and it turns out this thing is an infimum by Ornstein by lemma, or whatever, a Fekete's lemma in the case of Z, uh, more general things for amenable groups. Um, and here is inequality, whatever. Uh, thing is, you can compute this always as an infimum, uh, and it's got this nice formula. So, okay, that's for a general subshift. Oh, uh, so let me give you a very, very simple example. Say I take the subshift on Z, which is defined uh, by the condition that no two ones appear adjacent to each other. So I have zeros and ones, and my only condition is that I never see two ones sitting next to each other. So I can verify that the language of size one is, well, I can have zeros and ones, that's fine. Language of size two, I can have zero, 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 one, one, zero, I can have one, one. And if I want to see how many words of length n I have, there are two possibilities. I take a word of length n, it either finishes with a one or a zero. If it finishes with a zero, I can put anything before, so I get the language of size n minus one. If it finishes with a one, I'm forced to put a zero before, and then I fill up the rest with any word of length n minus two. So I get this nice recurrence. And if you are familiar with this recurrence, you're gonna recognize the Fibonacci sequence. So I know that this language grows like one plus uh, log right square root of five divided by two. So the entropy of this thing has this nice formula, one plus square root of five divided by two. Okay, it's just an example. But the interesting question is, well, there are countably many subsets of finite type. So there are many real numbers. Topological entropies are non-negative real numbers. So what are the numbers that I can get as entropies of subshifts of finite type, right? It's a countable class, so I can't get everything. So what do I actually get? It's an interesting question. And as I said uh, before, uh, Doug Lind is gonna see his name in, in this slide. Uh, there's a very nice characterization of the entropies of set subshifts of finite type uh, for the case where the dimension is one. And it's nice because it's completely algeb algebraic. The entropies of set subshifts of finite type are precisely the non-negative rational multiples of logarithm of Perron numbers lambda, where the Perron number is just an algebraic integer which, is strictly, which strictly dominates all of its algebraic conjugates. Okay, so... This theorem is very nice. It comes from looking at subshifts of finite type uh, through matrices, uh, figuring out that mixing subshifts of finite type uh, come from primitive matrices, doing parallel theory on primitive matrices, and then showing that you can actually realize every, every one, every parallel number uh, through, in this way. Okay, it's a nice theorem of Doug Lin uh, from 86. Okay. So that's nice, but uh, another interesting question is what happens when the dimension is larger than two? So uh, people in the community had to wait for many, many years to get an answer to this question. Uh, I wasn't even born by the time this theorem was there, so I didn't have to wait, but many people here did. And the, 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 the answer was actually given just on 2010 uh, by Hoffman and Mirovich, and it was of a computable nature. The entropies of CD subshifts of finite type for dimension two or more are precisely non negative real numbers which are upper semi computer. So I have to tell you what that means. A real is upper semi computable if I can find the Turing machine which an input n outputs a rational qn, and the infimum of these rational numbers is r. So this is a very weird definition. There's just a Turing machine that's uh, vomiting. Uh, rational numbers, and the infimum of these numbers is r. So somehow um, I am able to give you upper bounds for your number. I can tell you that these upper bounds will eventually converge, but I don't know how. It might be that the Turing machine is telling me one, 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 and after 10,000 million steps, it says, oh, 0 0.5. So, I know that this Turing machine is gonna eventually converge, but I don't know how fast. 
and I have no way of knowing. So this is a huge class of numbers. Roughly everything that you can think of is upper semi-computable. Uh, so all algebraic numbers, uh, pi, e, uh, every constant that comes up in a natural way is upper semi-computable. It's, it's a huge, huge class. So um, the theorem says that every single one of these upper semi-computable numbers can be obtained as the topological entropy of a subshift of finite type or dimension g. And what I claim here is that using this beautiful theorem that I told you before, uh, the proof is not so hard. So let me give you first the easy direction. Uh, the easy direction is that whenever you have a CD SFT, the entropy is upper semi-computer. Well, uh, what I could do is the following. I have my SFT. There's a finite list of forbidden patterns. So I can define LK log N as the set of patterns which support the ball of radius k, for which there is a pattern which support the ball of radius n. I'm thinking n is bigger than k, such that when I restrict to k, I see p, and k contains no forbidden patterns. So in other words, it's a huge pattern where I can see nothing forbidden. And if I restrict, oh, I see, I see the nice pattern p. So the interesting thing is that by compactness for every k in n, uh, I can find uh, I can find an end such that actually this is the language, because otherwise I would be able to construct arbitrarily large patterns which do not contain which contain this pattern P. So eventually, by compactness, I get a, an actual configuration with no forbidden patterns which contains P. So these things do converge. I don't know how fast, but they do converge. And what I could do is well, I just uh, for every n I take the minimum of the potential values of the entropy up to this thing. And well, I know that the entropy is actually the infimum of all these things. I know that these things converge when n grows big enough. So the infimum of all these numbers is actually the entropy, right? And each one of these numbers I can test with an algorithm. It just uh, suffices to feel all the symbols and check for all the forbidden patterns, right? So. Here's a computer program that gives me a sequence of rationals that converges from above to the, to the topological entropy. OK, so this is the easy direction. For the hard direction, we just have to use the theorem. So I'm going to take an upper semi-computable number, and I need to find a set square SFT with entropy R. How do I do it? Well, I first I do a, a simple trick. I'm going to take R and divide it by log K such that the number that remains is in zero one. I can do that because log k is an upper semi-computable number and this thing is a field, so I can divide. Uh, so r prime is upper semi-computable. So there is an algorithm, a Turing machine that produces this sequence of rational numbers such that the infimum is r prime. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna define a one-dimensional subshift that's given by the forbidden patterns where a pattern is forbidden if the number of ones is larger than qn. So I just look at the density of ones in a world of length n, and I don't want the density to be larger than this upper bound qn. OK. So that's the idea. The density of ones in words of length n is bounded above by qn, and thus asymptotically, the density of these ones should be R. OK, so by the fact that I can produce these numbers QN with a Turing machine, it follows that set is an effectively closed subshift. OK, because I have a Turing machine that's uh, giving me these QNs. All right, so what do I do? I look at the simulation theorem. I tell you an extra thing that I didn't mention before. This SFT from this construction actually has entropy zero. So it's a special pair of their construction. The SFT has entropy zero. And I take, so, so I grab this set that I just constructed. I get this X. And now I consider the following space. I'm going to take X product, a full shift on kappa plus one symbols. And I'm going to take the subset of all those configurations that satisfy that symbols that map to zero on an X are mapped with zero on the other coordinate, if and only if. So this is better seen with an image. Essentially what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take all symbols that map to a one and I'm gonna 
multiply them. I'm going to create K kappa independent copies to generate entropy with the nice density. So this is the thing. In every slide, horizontal slide, I have something that has some density. It's close to some density. And what I do is I associate the zero symbols on the first coordinate to zeros and the symbols that go to ones, I multiply them. In this case, I multiply by three, kappa equals three. So what I'm going to do is just create some entropy. Why? Because if now I look at some box of size n, well, how many, how large is the language in this new subshift? Well, it's essentially how large was the language uh, on the subshift x. And for each one of them, I have roughly kappa to the power n squared qn. Right, qn was the density of ones. So uh, n squared times qn is the number of ones that I have in this box of size n by n. And uh, I just have for which one of them kappa different possibilities. Formally speaking, this is an upper bound, but it's actually also a lower bound. It's not so hard to work down, to work up. And well, as I said, QN goes to R. Uh, the entropy of X is zero. So this log of LN is little over N squared. So it turns out that the entropy of this subshift that I, a finite type that I just constructed is exactly R. Okay, so this is uh, Hoffman Majorovich's theorem as a corollary of assimilation theorem. Okay, so what I wanted to do here is to show you a few things. First, that many well known dynamical systems are effective. Second, that several problems in dynamics, for instance, classifying entropies, admit solutions in terms of computability. And third, that these kind of universality results can be used as black boxes, as before to solve interesting problems, right? So for instance, this problem about uh, entropies or creating free SFTs, I can use this kind of results as black boxes. Okay, so that's everything I wanted to say this week. And I'm gonna give you just a few uh, things of what I want to do next week. Uh, I want to present a strong, a very, very strong universality property for certain classes of non-aminable groups. So, these kind of theorems that I presented, you require a, a bigger group to, to do the simulation, to have the SFT. I'm going to present a nice class of groups where you don't actually have to change your group, where every effective action is actually going to be the factor of an SFT. That's a very strong property. And we're going to call themselves simulable groups. I'm going to talk about them next week. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the rigidity properties of those groups. They happen to be, uh, that's a property which is invariant under quasi isometries of finitely presented groups and so forth. And I'm going to give you a few examples of these groups. And a very interesting thing is that uh, this notion of self simulability that I'm going to talk about gives a characterization of the possible amenability of Thomson F, which is a very nice open question. So I'm going to show actually that Thomson F is amenable. If and only if there is an effectively close action, which is not the factor of an SFT. So I have no idea how to prove uh, if that happens or not, but it gives a computable characterization of that open problem, which I think is very interesting. So that's what I'm going to talk next week. Thank you for your attention. So thanks. Um. Uh, yeah, thanks for the for the great talk. Um, thanks. Are there, are there any questions like any, anybody can can jump in. I have a couple of questions. Um, in your definition, your symbolic version of Thomson's group F. Uh, so it, is it the group generated by these prefix things? Or is it yeah. the case that the composition of these prefix things is also a prefix thing? Or do you yeah, that's not so easy to show, but you can you can do it. Actually, the the easy way to so let me let me go to this slide. Sorry. Yeah. So the group of all homomorphisms that satisfy these properties right. that forms a group. It's not immediate that this group is finitely generated. You can you can show that uh, with some work. Actually, this this uh, homomorphism that I gave here is one of the generators of Thomson's groups. Of, of Thomson Ceph. Uh, so that's uh, that's that's one thing. And um, sorry, well, and uh, the fact that these things, uh, the composition of these maps is also a map of this form, 
you can do directly. It's not so hard, but there's an easier way of doing that, which is you can interpret these maps as homomorphisms of the line with uh, a dyadic yeah, uh, slope and whatnot. That's the usual way Thompson's group is presented. That's if it. you present it that way, the fact that the composition is also an element of that way of, of the group is easier. But in this way, uh, the computability properties are nicer. <laughs> you can see things easily. For instance, this way, it's easy to see that V is not amenable. Why is that easy? And that T is not amenable. Why is that easy? Uh, because uh, if you had an invariant measure, uh, you, uh, you have, well, you have a, <clears throat> uh, sorry. If you have an invariant measure, uh, then uh, you, can, you, can, you can send any, uh, sorry, with V and with T, you can send any uh, cylinder to any other cylinder. So every cylinder should have the exact same measure, and that gives you a contradiction. So that action has no invariant measure, so it is not amenable. So with cylinders, that's easy to see. Of course, that doesn't work with T, because T has two fixed points, 0 and 1. Sorry, with F. Because in F, you need uh, to have the, uh, the lexicographical order, and that forces you to fix uh, zero and one in this natural action. So, so you do have known? invariant measures. So is that known? Is F amenable or not? If it, is it known whether it's amenable? It's open. It's open. And the other question is uh, uh, <clears throat> Hoffman and Merovich, they